Hello everybody and welcome to season 3 of Travel Stories with Marsh. So if you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then this is the right place for you because here every week I will be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. So today's episode is dedicated to all the foodies out there because we are going to be discussing all things food and travel. And to take us on a mouth-watering journey around the world, I have none other than the food diva herself, Samantha Wood. Samantha is not only the founder of the award-winning restaurants review website fooddiva.net but she is also a member of the Global Guild of Food Writers in addition to being a board advisor for the UAE Restaurants Group and she joins us on the podcast today to take us on a delectable journey around the world. Welcome to the podcast Samantha and thank you so much for joining us here on this episode today. Well, you are the final word when it comes to where to dine and where to eat here in the UAE. So, you know what I want to ask you if somebody wants to visit the UAE or Dubai and they want to explore the culinary scene over here, where do you think they should begin? The beauty of Dubai is we actually have every cuisine under mm-hmm. the sun here. There's so many so yeah. many different yeah. options. Yeah. We're beginning to see more Middle Eastern and even Emirati concepts mm-hmm. um blossoming here. Um you obviously have Orfali Brothers which has won a lot of awards now so I expect um your your listeners will know mm-hmm. will know about it but I do think it's also a good place to start because you will get a taste of the region and a lot of history on that plate as yeah. well. Yeah. And their food is also so uh well thought of and so artistic so I think it's a good place to yeah. start like you said. But do you have any favorite areas in Dubai when it comes to just you know going on kind of a little food tour because you know a lot of people say i mean people who have come on the podcast will you know say okay you have to go on a one dirham abra right don't miss that when you come to dubai so is there something that you would say well try not to miss i mean of course it's difficult to say which restaurant to go mm. but in terms of areas if you want to say you know please go try and explore that would you say like a particular area like yeah, that yeah i think exists? you should definitely go to bastakia and mm-hmm. al sif um that essentially is our old town that's mm-hmm. been regenerated mm-hmm. and i think it's a real shame when you see a lot of people come and and don't leave their five star hotels or mm-hmm. jump from one one five star hotel to True. another um the beauty of dubai is its homegrown independence uh, restaurant scene and actually that's what i only write about that's mm-hmm. what i only showcase in my dining experiences in itineraries that i put together for travelers because it would be a real shame to come here and eat in a celeb chef's restaurant that you can get in your in your home country. Exactly. So definitely do cover go to Bastaki especially when the weather's lovely and you can do that walk mm-hmm. and you can get on an Abra um 100% that's a good place um that's a good place mm-hmm. to start. Well that's a great recommendation. And Ara- an Arabian tea house for uh-huh. instance is there. I always take visitors there for breakfast or for lunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah and the Arabian tea house is really nice and that's a great recommendation homegrown restaurants and this is something people should explore. Yeah. So okay so now let's begin with the first question of the podcast which I call my star question and this is a travel podcast. So where will you be taking us on a journey to day. Well, I'm going to kick off with Cyprus. Mm-hmm. So, um, obviously Cyprus is um my home country. It's where I visit every year. My parents live there. So, um I do obviously naturally have a soft spot for it. What is it about Cyprus that attracts you so much? And when you're saying you want to take us on a journey, mm. tell us a bit more about the land you know why would the listeners today just go to cyprus you know in general because when you talk about cyprus a lot of people out there will talk about hey go to ayana pa party come back but there must be i mean i'm sure we will you know go through all those different places through this podcast but if you were to tell people to go visit cyprus for one particular reason why But what definitely don't be? go to Ayanna mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. We we actually have um a summer place on the coast just further down in Protaras. 
But um, the beauty of Cyprus, and this is what I always um, tell people, and I have this guide that I update every year, is heading off the beaten track. You have to hire a car if you want to see the real Cyprus. You have to head into the hills, into the mountains, where you have these beautiful tavernas mm -hmm. um, serving meze style food, um, a lot cheaper than you will get on these strips in Ayanapa or in that ass. Um, and so you really need to do that um, to actually experience the authentic Cyprus. So head off the coastline and go inland okay. um, into the mountain villages or further on, on to the east coast as well, rather than um, onto the west coast, rather than the east coast, which is where Ayanapa is. And, you know, to just talk a little bit more about Cyprus, uh, where do you think people should begin their journey? Because, you know, you land and then you have this huge island and people sure. don't really know where to go. So where would you tell them to begin their journey? So you're landing in Larnaca, which is a port city. Now, Larnaca does have a beautiful old town. Mm. So it's a great place to perhaps stay for one night um, and then wander around that old town and get, get a perspective on of um, the city and then hire your car and then you're it, literally in the middle of the island. So it's a great place to travel to and from. And mm -hmm. then you can head up into the mountains from there. Now, you've got lots of cities um, on the coast, apart from Nicosia, which is literally in the middle of middle sort of north east of the island mm -hmm. um you have limassol um Min limassol has a, um, a large expat community mm -hmm. actually a lot of arabs um there as well it's a port city but mm -hmm. it's it's a good place to to start you can go to paphos which is on the west coast and again head inland mm -hmm. um as well okay it's it's not a small island but it's it's no, not it's massive. You can go from one end to the other yeah. in essentially three three hours, three, three and a half hours. Yeah, there, yeah. Are, there are good motorways there as yeah. well. No, so it, it allows you to explore. No, you're right. It's not a very small island though because you no. want, yeah. Because no. I went there many, many years right. ago and we, I mean, I stayed in Limassol but explored yeah. everywhere else. Like you said, don't go to Ayanapa. So what is it, you know, if you're seeking something, if you're going to Cyprus, you know, go there if you want this. What would you say yeah. to people? It's it's about eating local. Like mm. Now I firm that's my mantra wherever I travel. Mm. But particularly in Cyprus, and perhaps because I know it so well, I would not eat anything but Cypriot or perhaps Greek food, because mm. there are some differences between Cypriot and Greek food. Halloumi is mm. um, indigenous to Cyprus. You mm. can only call it halloumi. It's PDO protected. The same way you can only call champagne if it comes from the champagne region mm. in France. Halloumi has to be made in Cyprus. It's a mix of goat and sheep milk. But um, eat local. That's why I say head to the tavernas. We have so many beautiful tavernas where you can order different... Um, we call them mezeres, which is essentially a, a series of meze small plates. Mm. Um, very affordable. You have a lot of fish tavernas where you choose your fish mm -hmm. um, on the display. Halloumi will feature either grilled or fried in, in some kind mm. of format. So if you're looking but, like a slow travel kind of a situation yeah. where you eat local, you know, live local, you know, that's the kind of experience you would recommend to anybody who wants to visit Cyprus. Yes. Yeah. And the thing that I always eat on my first First night mm. is souvlaki in bita. Mm -hmm. So that is souvlaki are our kebabs. Mm. We eat a lot of pork in Cyprus. Um, pork and lamb, not so much, um, not as much beef. Chicken we do as well. It's our sort of street food, if you mm. like. We'd either order it or we'd drive up and we'd pick it up and we'd take it home and you'd have it with a glass of red wine. Or I actually have it with a glass of champagne because wow. that's what I, I like was almost to do. transported back to Cyprus. Yeah. And also I went there many, many years ago. So I really think I should revisit and, you know, go to these different tavernas, like you said. A hundred percent. So, you know, yeah. you're a culinary expert um, and your work, you know, takes you around the world. So, um, you know, when you traveled, it's it's no surprise that, you know, food and cultures intermingle with each other. Yeah. So when in your travels, which are the most interesting uh, areas of the world that you saw that, you know, the culture was very interesting or the food was very interesting and they were so easily kind of existed together? Oh, it's, it's a tough question because for me, 
Food is culture. Mm -hmm. I um, firmly believe that you can discover more in a country by visiting the right mm -hmm. restaurants and eating well. I mean, in my research, I will ask locals that have lived there mm -hmm. where to go. I want to eat local when yeah. I'm there. Yeah. So I'm looking for these sort of hidden gems. Um, and, and that doesn't have to be fine dining. It could be little cafes yeah. Yeah. Um, and little joints. But um, that's the best way to discover a country. But it is true, you know, food is culture, uh, you know, and um, it's interesting that, you know, you have everything sorted out. And I like to travel like that, where, you know, I don't like surprises when it comes to food, because yeah. sometimes when you're really hungry, you make the wrong decisions and bad food can really annoy yeah. or irritate anybody. So which has been the most unforgettable food experience uh, for you while traveling? The number one foodie destination for me so far has been San Sebastian. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's in the Basque region and North Spain. And it's known for its high concentration of mm -hmm. Michelin restaurants, but mm -hmm. that's not why it's memorable for me. Yes, there are some good Michelin restaurants there. There are also some bad Michelin restaurants there, but it's the Pincho bars. And pinchos are bite-sized tapas, essentially. And you literally have a gazillion of these bars dotted around the old... It's a beautiful old town. There's mm -hmm. a, a wonderful cathedral there. It's um, You can go up on a hill. There's a beach. It's a coastal city. But the old town literally has um, hundreds of these little bars... Mm. Um, where it's all about these bite-sized dishes. Now, you'll, you walk into a bar just so you can picture it, and a lot of them are on the counter. But the top tip is don't order what's on the counter because obviously whatever's been sitting on the counter has mm. been sitting there mm. for a while. But each bar will have one or two specialties. And again, they're bite-sized dishes or in sort of small plates. You order one or two from each bar. Mm -hmm. um, they have a local white wine, which is quite low low in alcohol, that they serve. And, and then you hop on to the next one. Um, and that's where the, the Basque cheesecake trend originated with a restaurant there, a bar there called La Nina, that all it made was this Basque cheesecake. I actually don't think it's that great. There's a better one in Bilbao, but... That's uh, another topic. But you go there. When when I went and we spent, I think it was five, six days in San Sebastian, and we did some Michelin mm -hmm. 50 best restaurants, but we literally, every day we went back to the old town mm. and we essentially had our breakfast and lunch um, in these in these bars. Yeah, and this is perhaps where you don't need to plan. You can, because all yes. of them are so good, you can just hop but into... Having said that, like with anything, there are some good bars and some not so mm -hmm. great bars. So mm -hmm. it does help to do a little bit of research. Right, yeah. <laughs> of course. Now, you just said, uh, you know, San Sebastian. And of course, you know, all the foodies out there will know that why yeah. San Sebastian is so famous. But is that also your favorite experience in terms of food uh, while traveling? It is, it is a favorite, but as a one day or one night experience, I would pick the chef's table at Gagan in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. It's 14 seaters. It's a 14 seat chef's table concept, but it's more than the food. Um, and I think you have to have Gagan to get the right experience because he's an entertainer. He pairs every dish. So it's, I think it's about 18, 20, maybe even 24 dishes, essentially, not so much courses. Um, each one is paired with a different tune that he is coordinating from his iPad. It's his own personal playlist. Once you've eaten your bite, yeah. you just want to dance. But um, at the same time in Bangkok as well, you have um, a hawker stall that got a Michelin star, yeah. but j Fi, and she makes this crab omelette. That is probably the mm. best thing I mm -hmm. have ever eaten. Mm. So Bangkok really is on top of the yes. list when it comes to your and food it's experiences. Very cheap. Yeah, Bangkok. Well, I've done Gagan. I yeah. haven't done uh, the Hawker. J Five. Yeah, yes. I haven't done uh, that one. But I went to Gagan before he moved to the okay. new location in that beautiful house. Yes, yeah. but it was a lot of food. I think Gagan has reduced the number of dishes in his oh, new restaurant okay. actually, um, which is good. Which I think is a yeah. good thing. So. 
you know, we spoke about this fabulous experiences that you've had in Bangkok specifically. But, you know, um, I'm sure you have travel bloopers because when we travel, things happen. So have there been instances in your life where, you know, you came across something which you don't really remember fondly, even if it comes to, you know, food while traveling? One of the worst, probably the worst fine dining experience I have ever had was in San Sebastian at Mugaritz, which at the time was number seven Ooh, on 50 really? Best, had two stars, I believe. Um, it was one of these four plus hours experiences. The food had zero flavor. Oh. Um, we were sitting in a very sterile dining room where you were literally surrounded by people that you could tell were just there to tick it off their bucket list, probably as was I. Mm -hmm. And But... There was no flavor to the food. That's a shame, isn't it? We actually it? went to some pincho bars after that oh, wow. um, because we were so hungry. No, that's and ridiculously shame. That's expensive. That's a shame. As well. Exactly. It's yeah. ridiculously expensive. That's number one. And also yeah. the wait, you know, to go into these restaurants around the world, you have to book in advance, like so many months 100%. in advance. And to have this experience, that's really a, yeah. you know, a downer. But, you know, of course, this was one experience. But would you ever go back to San Sebastian for that same experience again? I'd go life? back to San Sebastian for the Pincho bars mm -hmm. and actually Arzac as well, which was a fabulous restaurant. And to go to Echabara and there's a turbot restaurant as well but I would definitely not, not go back go to, to Mugaritz okay. I, there's far too many restaurants in this world for okay. me but to San be Sebastian able. has happy memories yeah. for you but let's talk about hidden gems now like you know there must be culinary surprises around the world that you want to tell our listeners about a great way to see a country if you're not quite sure and also to get a grasp of the history is to book a food tour in mm -hmm. that country like a street food tour but um, I go back, I'm going to have to go back to Cyprus. Um, but again, head off the beaten track. And it's it's those it's those little tavernas. Mm -hmm. And there, we have a lot in Cyprus and I have a guide on which tavernas to go to as well. But I mean, there's one in particular that I go to every year because they hand churn their own halloumi. Oh, it's wow. literally um, warm, um, straight from the, from, from the goats, uh, the goats and the sheep that they have just milked. Mm -hmm. um, to make this hand churned halloumi, and I, I buy, I buy the halloumi. I get them to vacuum pack it, and I bring it back with me, and I fill my freezer with it. So you saying you say that the tavernas in Cyprus is is you call them a hidden gem? Give us. I'm very intrigued about these tavernas. Mm -hmm. Give us a little peek into this tour of the tavernas in Cyprus. Which are your favorite ones? Do you want to give us names? So Mus Musigos, for instance, which is the one with the halloumi. Mm -hmm. It's it's set in a village on the east coast but it's inland it's not on the coast it's on the site of an old windmill so you're literally dining underneath the vines mm -hmm. um the great vines with um uh, this towering windmill above you so it's beautiful if you get there just at sunset um or at dusk so um you get um you almost get the shadow um of of the windmill actually it sounds gorgeous and um, it's indoor and outdoor so you can go there in the yeah. winter as well but i've actually never been in the winter i've only ever been in the summer because you can obviously sit outside um you're sitting on um sort of wooden um raffia um chairs they have a menu but what I recommend is you order the meze. Now, mm -hmm. the meze, you normally have a half meze or a full meze. A full meze could be 20 plus dishes. A half meze wow. is about 13, 14 dishes. And I mean, even the half meze is enough. It just depends on how much appetite you have. Because obviously it comes with fresh bread. Um, sourdough was is a thing in Cyprus before sourdough became a trend. That oh, is really? how they make their bread in, in the village. Um, and again, it's you go there for the halloumi because it comes in a whole slab with a knife um, literally in the middle of it. And you literally open it up and it's oozing out. Oh my and you God. can just eat it with a spoon, frankly. You don't need any accompaniment. You don't need tomatoes. You don't need honey. It's, it's 
salty but not too salty yeah um it's just it's just wonderful yeah and this is uh towards which part of cyprus did you say um and this is on the east coast on and the-, the village of sodira so it's probably about a half hour 40 minute drive from ayanaba actually mm-hmm. if um so if you were staying and doing that tacky part of the island you could easily easily venture there but i think the person that will go to ayanaba is not the person yeah. that will probably but that seek is, out that is a fantastic yeah. fantastic hidden gem that you just gave yeah. away it's I not mean. on social media yeah. um but it's a very busy restaurant like mm. in the summer If you want to go on a weekend, you've got to book at least a month in advance. Mm. But you call them up. There's no online booking yeah, system. And yeah. actually with most of these tavernas, you yeah. just you just call them up. Yeah. So go to Cyprus for so much of delectable yeah. amazing food then. I mean, this is an amazing culinary journey we are on. But you know, let's also talk a little bit about responsible travel. I mean, um, you know, food and travel and uh, being responsible while eating as we are traveling. Uh this is something I want to focus on. I mean whatever you do in your own little way. So what do you do as a culinary expert who travels around the world? What do you do for mm-hmm. responsible travel in your own way? I think that the best way to support responsible travel it's really to eat local. To support local. Um, it's to su- and yeah. support the local community. Yeah. I don't want to go to Italy and eat Japanese yeah. sushi yeah. or sashimi. When yeah. I go to Italy, I will I will if I go to Napoli, I'm going to eat pizza. Mm-hmm. um it is the home of the napolitan pizza when i go to japan and and that's the beauty of japan actually it's very hard to not eat local mm. um so you go it's one of the few places that if you want sushi and sashimi you go to certain restaurants you will not find um yakitori in the same restaurant that you're eating sashimi True. um you go to the fish market mm. um one of my sort of most sort of eye opening experiences was going to the tuna auctions in um, in Japan and then you go to these sushi and sashimi bars that um surround the fish market it's mm. the most incredible yeah experience there yeah. no yeah. but uh, that is responsible travel to support local i mean that yeah. is i mean i mean responsible travel has so many different ways you know so yeah, many different exactly, ways yeah. you can support uh you know of the place that you go to you know so uh, eating local is one of the big ones and and lot of people don't realize that but i also want to talk about uh, what you would recommend for culinary travel as a as an expert in food where would you recommend that people should go to experience food and what which is the best area of the world for culinary travel according to you so i have visited australia um a few times um and along with south africa i think they are probably of the two most underrated mm. countries on a global scale the protein that you're eating there the vegetable they're all sourced locally in australia in australia and in south africa in south africa you have incredible meat in both countries actually mm. you have incredible seafood oysters um in um australia and also in south africa so they're very similar in terms um of the sourcing and as a result you get a lot of you get real sort of farm to table mm. restaurants there um they're very affordable in particular south africa you ask an australian yeah. and they think australia is expensive for us going there it's very cheap um and, and south africa and both of them also have incredible wine scenes mm. um and again very affordable again, in particular um south africa on that front so this very self sustainable and mm. i think there are two destinations that if you are a foodie mm. you must visit and there's also plenty to see mm. um as well in mm. terms in of both. sites yeah. and and driving and whether in south africa you obviously can go to the safaris mm. as well um so it ticks a lot of a lot of boxes so you would yeah. say australia and south africa are the kind of destinations to go to for culinary travel and especially if you believe in eating local and this whole farm to table yeah. kind of yeah. a concept. I mean there are yeah. lots of dishes. I mean we talked about San Sebastian, we've yeah. talked about Bangkok. Yeah. Uh, no, I there's, found it there's, there's very there's interesting. I yeah. found it very interesting because you said Australia because nobody's really talked about Australia from a food 
perspective, you know. Very interesting places. I mean, Australia and South Africa for culinary travel. But uh, let's, so we have these two places for culinary travel. But otherwise, on a whole, in terms of traveling this year, which is that one destination that you would highly recommend that people should visit in 2024? Right, okay. I think, listen, everywhere we've talked about are places that I feel people should go should to. Should go, yeah. Um, we've obviously talked about Cyprus. Um, I think San. If you're a foodie, definitely, definitely do the Pincho bars in San Sebastian. Bastion, yeah. at number one on your list. I think Bangkok is a great foodie city, but. I adore Iranian cuisine. Mm-hmm. I, I went to both Tehran and to Esfahan. Um, I'd like to go back to go to Shiraz, actually. But um, again, I mean, incredible food. Yeah, um, when people can go, yeah. people should go. And it's go, a very yeah. misunderstood country. Yeah, yeah. As that's well. what I've heard. Yeah. yeah, and the people are really nice. It's yeah. just so difficult yeah, to get extremely there. Extremely yeah. hospitable yeah. people. What is on your bucket list now? Okay. I mean, we've been to all these places, but surely there are many more places okay. that well, you want to I go have to. On my bucket list still is um, South America. Mm-hmm. I want to do it via a cruise because Mm. it's a vast continent i also want to go back to the caribbean i've been i've been to cuba and i'd love to go back to cuba as well Mm -hmm. actually because i think it's changed a lot um so yeah there's quite a lot there on my bucket list yeah and i'm like waiting for sure (laughs) but it's good isn't it at least it's good to have a bucket list because there are so many places in the world and south america is going to take away so much of your time because it's so huge over there and the food is or the meats over there in south america is just amazing yeah uh, i mean yeah again the meat there is when you eat the meat there is so Different. different the taste is so different than what we eat here but um we almost have come to the end of the podcast now this was a fabulous journey into all the different places uh, culinary journeys around the world really enjoyed enjoyed this conversation and i'm sure all the listeners are now you know making up notes on specifically on where to go in cyprus this was really great thank you so much for making the time samantha thank you for having me mush i've really enjoyed thank it thank you yeah. thank you thank you Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope our conversations have fueled your imagination and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And until the next time, safe travels and keep exploring.